Okay, guidance. Right? So that's kind of the first one that we can think about. How do you fake guidance? What we're talking about here is graduated guidance, right? Um, so uh, I'm going to use this woodworking example. Oh, well, right? I do a lot of woodwork. So sometimes those pop into my examples because they're usually fresh in my head. Right? Uh, so the first time I teach something, I teach some woodworking skills as well. So when I teach somebody how to do woodwork, um, I teach a lot of hand tool use, you know, the, some of the old traditional techniques from the 17, 1800s type thing. It's just fun, right? So I'll work with somebody on, a, let's say, a hand plane. Okay? And that hand plane is, you know, it's easy to see how it works. It's hard to actually do it. So what I'll do is I'll actually guide the person's hands at first and guide their body and get them standing in the right position. Um, and when they're standing in that right position, then I can kind of help them move along. So I'm guiding them. I'm actually Pushing their and pushing on their hands, I'm holding their elbows into their body. I'm guiding them as they move down the wood. And they are actually supposed to walk with it. You lock your body in place, and you just kind of walk with that uh, um, with that hand plane. Um, rather than using your arms and your shoulders to move it, you use your entire body to move the thing. So then the next step would be, okay, to, you know, you've, you've established these procedures, and now I'm going to back off my guidance a little bit. So instead of helping guide you in terms of how to walk, maybe I'll stand on the other side of the board and help you hold your hands. And then I'll back off on the hand holding, and literally, quite literally, and then I'll let you do it yourself, that type of thing. So I'm fading that guidance out. Um, this happens a lot of time with kids that uh, like trying to learn how to eat, right? So you guide the spoon into their mouth, and then eventually you kind of just shadow them, right? You you follow their their hands as they're putting the spoon into their mouth, um, but then it, then you don't have to be there at all. So you know you're fading out that that guidance. Um, a fun example of this is uh, like teaching kids numbers, right? So let's look at an example here. So fading from items to a number. So maybe the kid can count, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven items. Yeah, there's seven items there. All right, so the kid can count. There's seven items, but they don't do well with numbers. So let's look at what we can do with that. So let's take those seven items and organize them as a seven and then ask the kid to count that. All right, say, how many are there? Seven. You say, you're right, there's seven. And look, that number is a seven. Now we're going to go a step further. Now, it's really hard to tell. Or actually, not in this one, it's not hard to tell. But now we added the, that line, right? So it's actually a seven. Okay. Now we're going to start even more fading here, and we're going to slowly fade out those green dots. Now, for the sake of space, I didn't do 37 steps. I did just one more step here, but you'll get the idea. So those green dots are getting more faint, so they're disappearing. There's still seven there, and the, the, so the kids should now be focusing on the fact that those two lines make a number seven. And then you can conclude with a seven. Right? So they were able to say seven at that, in that one context. They knew what seven was, seven items, right? And then now we're changing that into a number seven, which means the same thing. So there's a fading procedure for you. Um, we can do fading in reading in phonics, right? So um, in some phonics-based approaches, namely the, the Siegfried approach, uh, Siegfried, and, sorry, Siegfried and Engelmann, um, Engelmann's approach, um, we, he has, I can't remember how many letters it is, but there's like, uh, I can't remember, 30 or 40 letters, right, uh, that he teaches kids because he teaches the sounds first. So at SH, S is one sound, S, and H is another sound. But SH is its own sound, shh. Okay. So we actually teach using that, uh, using Engelman's approach, you teach SH as one letter, like that. Okay. And then you fade that out slowly into this. So now you've taught the kid that SH always means shh. But that's not how to write it. You don't connect the S and the H. You actually leave them separate, like what's at the end of this, this fading example. So you slowly fade out those, those letters, and you separate them. You just, they're close together at first, and then you have a little bit of space, and a little bit more space, and then a little bit more space until it's like it should be. So now the kid knows how to pronounce it. They, they treat it as its own letter at first, and then later they learn that it's not its own letter. It's just a, those two letters together make a sound. We can also fade verbal prompts. This is something I do again in woodworking when I'm telling people what to do. So when I'm doing that guidance on the, the hand plane, the guidance actually fades into a verbal prompt. And I say, all right, hand down, shoulders up, move your hips and put and walk, not push, but and walk. And then I can fade those out and say, okay, hands down. Right? So in other words, you're pushing down with your hands, right? And then you can, you can fade out those particular verbal prompts. And eventually all you have to do is say, all right, go plane that piece of wood. 
Right? It really means 10 different things, 10 different things you have to do. And I started out with physically guiding them, right? and then I started, then I moved that into verbal guiding, and then our verbal prompts, and then I faded out those verbal prompts. And every once in a while, you still have to remind people, and say, oh, what, what, what procedure am I working? Oh, yeah, that's right, I gotta do that next, I gotta do that next step. And it's like, so I'll make you make that verbal statement. So, and then, like we already talked about, from one setting, you know, from a one-on-one -on -one setting, you know, so you can fade uh, the context from maybe a kid will answer to the request of what's your name. So, and the, hi, what's your name, right? Maybe they'll do that in a one-on-one -on -one setting, they'll answer properly, but maybe they won't do it in a group setting. So you can slowly fade that, and it's really straightforward. Add another person, and another, and another, and change context a little bit. Next thing you know, the kid's answering the question in the presence of a lot of people, and not an issue. Uh, this is often how kind of teaching works. A lot of times you start teaching in front of a small group of people. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, like at the university level. You kind of start in front of a small group, and then later you add more and more and more and more. Okay? And then you can be lecturing in front of 200, 300, 400 people. It's no big deal. Right? So you're just fading from one setting to another. 